Hello, today we'll be talking about one of the most uh, important topics that have been dividing our country, uh, uh, the mistreatment of police, um, excuse me, the, how police mistreat minorities. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about racial profiling. I'll talk about the different types of discrimination that, that leads to racial profiling. I'll talk to you about how academics and researchers try to figure out r how racial profiling exists and we'll be talking about some new research that some colleagues and I have found, and it actually kind of leads to some hope for the future. So uh, it's surprising that economic research might lead to hope. Well, I'll, hopefully you'll, you'll see this too. So racial profiling is uh, an extremely divisive topic. It's been tearing our nation apart. Um, there's been protests all across the nation, right? Um, both by the citizens and the NFL, the uh, trying to show their displeasure with how, the, how police are mistreating minorities. Um, it's really, so it's certainly a very important topic. For, as a researcher, it's also really important too because there's many lawsuits against government and, and police forces accusing the police force of, of racial profiling. And you can't just have anecdotal evidence, you need to have some proof. And so the, the court systems call, call to the academics to figure out does in fact some police department, are they actually profiling? And so uh, it's a really important su subject for academics to try to come up with an answer or a way to figure out if, if minorities are being profiled against. So the, the new research I'm gonna be talking about today kind of answers two questions. The first one's less important. First we need to show do officers actually learn? Uh, and we call it learning by doing. Do they just improve in general? We kind of need that to see if officers, as they gain experience, uh, if, they, if they actually change their proclivity to racially profile. And then the second one is the most important one. Do we find a relationship between an officer's experience and how likely they are gonna racially profile? Uh, in the paper, which you can fall asleep to, we. We find, we use lots of different measures of experience. Today I'm gonna to show you results of using time or years on the, on the police force as experience. But we also do this as number of stops, like how often are they out, out in the streets stopping in individuals and particularly number of minority stops. And we find actually very shockingly consistent results that, the, uh, which I'll, I'll get into in a second, oops. There are two main ways to measure racial, racial profiling, two main questions. The first one, which actually is, uh, my research is not covering today, is do officers overstop minorities? There's this complaint from minorities that, that when they're stopped they're, they're, or when they're walking around, they get stopped by officers very frequently. And the, the research, the, us academics have done a poor job. There's, it's an extremely difficult thing to figure out because how do you know if an officer is actually when they stop a minority or, or, or any citizen, is that a right thing to do? And so they, the, the best work that's being done, the very first work that was ever done is called a, very, it's called a crude best, uh, benchmark, and that's comparing the, per, num, the percentage of all the stops that are minority to the percentage of the population in some way, either the residential pres, uh, percent or the percent that's driving. There's been some very clever economists looking at street cameras because what you really want is what is called the at-risk population, which is fancy for those people who are committing crimes that an officer actually sees and they get to choose who, should they stop that person or not. And so they look at street cameras and you can figure out the color of the skin and figure out what, per what percentage of all the speeders are actually minority and that should be the correct percent. In my data, I'm gonna be studying the city of Syracuse. I got my PhD at Syracuse during this time period. And we'll be looking at uh, uh, 06 and 09, 45% of all the stops in, during this time period were, were minority stops. And only 27% of the population was, was minority. This is again, not a, a really great measure, but if you believe this, it would, it would suggest profiling against African-Americans at the stop. Second, and the question I'm gonna talk about today is frisking. Frisking and searching is extremely intrusive. I don't know if you've experienced it when an officer chooses to frisk or search your car. It's really intrusive. It, all of the high uh, profile incidents that happen in America almost always started with this and it's almost all, often they felt like they, they, it was unwarranted and they were frisked and searched and really harassed 
And so understanding how if an officer is correct or profiling in their decision to frisk or search is really an important one. This has been uh, spearheaded by some Wharton professors uh, in 2001. They wrote an insane amount of mathematical modeling, but uh, I simpled it down to two points. Officers try to maximize arrests in this model, and motorists try to uh, choose whether or not they're going to carry contraband or commit crimes or speed based on how often they stop. The important thing is this. After all that math, arrest rates should equalize. And it's very simple, actually, to think about this. If you're an officer and there's two groups and your goal is to maximize arrests, if one, one group has a very low success rate, every time you frisk them, it's unsuccessful, compared to this other group where you, you, your success rate's really high, you have to try to maximize your arrests. You're going to keep searching all the, the, whatever group has the highest success rate. And what should happen is, these things should equalize if you're an unbiased officer. If you're a biased officer, one that profiles, then you may dislike a specific group, minorities, and even though their, your success rate for minorities is very low, you will still continually frisk them because you have some bias against them. And so uh, that's kind of the, the thought process here. The motivate, there's two kind of motivating discriminations in, in, in economics. There's one is called statistical discrimination. Sorry to be the professor here for a second. S -s statistical discrimination is still discrimination. It's still very much against the law. You're not allowed to do it against protected subgroups. But it's important to know that this isn't personal bias. This is actually done often. My, a lot of my uh, young men here pay a lot more for car insurance. And even though there may be couple students that, are, uh, that you may be a very safe driver, you like to tell the car insurance, I promise you I'm a safe driver, but in fact, they don't know you for, for, for anything. So they're going to give you the group average. So they're going to say, well, you belong to this group of young males who tend to drive very dangerously, and even though you're a safe driver, we don't know you, and so you're going to have to pay the same group. We're going to give you, we're going to assume you're, you're in that group. So that is a great example of statistical discrimination. In, in, in statistical discrimination, the important thing to know is once you're informed of it, it's really a lack of information. So once the, the car insurance company realizes that you're a safe driver over time, they're going to lower your, your uh, insurance rates, and that's the correct thing. That means they've been given information, and then they figured, they've, uh, they figured out and lowered the rates. That's called statistical discrimination. The, uh, the alternative is called taste-based discrimination. This, got, this has been coined by a, a Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker, uh, uh, quite a few, long time ago. And this is just true dislike. You hate a specific group. And so there's kind of two different things going on here. There could be statistical discrimination. It's just you don't know anything about a group, or, and, but you're, you're happy to learn about that group, or it's just I actually dislike some, some subgroup. Um, and so that's called taste-based discrimination. The data, real quickly, is, is every discretionary police-citizen interaction in the city of Syracuse over four years. We had to work extensively with the police department because it's very straightforward to get arrest data. When you get arrested, they know your race, they take all this information down, they know exactly where it happened, they know which officer did it with you. And However, we need to know the failures, so we have to work with the city, uh, the police department, so when they, enter, they, they stopped you, you're a minority, they stopped you, they chose to frisk you and search your car, and, and they didn't find anything. Most police departments across the nation, they, just, they don't write anything up. We had to force, our, uh, with the city of Syracuse, the mayor, and the, and the police chief, force these officers to create a form, electronic, so they can punch these things very easily. So every interaction that an officer had with a citizen was recorded and, and information was given. Um, important, lastly, really importantly, is we had to have discretionary stops. So if you happen to call 911, that's a non-discretionary stop. That means the officer was forced to come to your house to help you, and regardless of your race, that wasn't their choice. We want an officer, biased or unbiased, walking around choosing who to, to stop and try to figure out if they're committing crimes. That's what we want, and so that's what we have. We have over 100,000 stops during this time period. On to the answers. The first one's uh, a little less interesting. Do officers become better at their job with more experience? And the answer is yes. Actually, over you can see that when an officer has zero years of experience, their success rate, regardless of race, is less than 
So what does that mean? That means they're terrible at making this choice, right? They see someone, and they're going to just frisk people all the time, and they're almost never right. They think this person, they're going to take the time to frisk them. They think they've committed a crime, and in fact, they have not, right? I find that pretty bad. And sadly, well, first of all, they do improve over the next 10 years, and then it kind of flattens out, if you will. Now, uh, it doesn't actually get too high. They're, you know, it looks like it, it maxes out around 25% or so, but uh, they're interacting a lot with civ civilians. The second question, which is the most, I think the most important, well, you're not supposed to see that, is how do, uh, how do officers' experience affect their uh, uh, proclivity or racially profile? You can think of three different worlds. You can think they start, an officer starts off unbiased, you're a new officer, you start off, and you're dealing every day with people who are unhappy with you, uh, that, that are untrusted, trustworthy with you, who are often having the worst day of their life. That's what the common saying is, officers deal with people on their worst day of their life, all day, every day. So you can imagine that process, the, the intenseness of it, you know, makes you maybe more likely to racially profile as you gain experience. Two, you could start off, you can have officers that are biased. They, they come onto the force biased, but maybe they learn over time. And then three, you can imagine some officers are terrible people and some of them are really wonderful people. And so uh, you can kind of have any one of these outcomes. Uh, off, uh, economists and researchers in general don't like to have a priori beliefs or thoughts before finding the results. I have to admit, I wonder what people think is the, what would be happening. My thought would be I've met some people that are wonderful and some people are less wonderful, and I think that kind of is, doesn't change over time. So I would have thought number three is the right answer. And this is the answer. Um, this is this KPT statistic, and the, how do you interpret this? Is if these things are negative, which is below that zero line, that means it's racially profiling against minorities. If it's actually a way positive, which some papers find, that means profiling against whites. And so we find here the first five years New officers are horrendous. They racially profile tremendously. To my shock, they improve. They get better. The model works. The, the, the math works. And, and it shows that after five years, essentially, officers have learned to not be racial profiling. Uh, not to speak econometrics, this is including what is called officer fix effects, which just means this is within officer. So we take each, one, each of you as an officer, you each individually kind of get better over time. I find this actually kind of amazing that this, is the, that this is the case. So we first of all, we find evidence of what is called learning by doing or on the job learning. We find that experience does matter. We find that inexperienced people, officers really uh, are, they start off profiling, but they, they actually get better after five years. This suggests there's no way to test this difference between statistical discrimination, which means just a lack of knowledge or information, versus racial bias, true hatred. But if it's true that officers are getting better, it actually, the, the, their profiling is not due to true dislike, right? Um, it ends up leading to really important policy implications. First, that profiling and, and, pers and, and, and bias against minorities can actually change. I wasn't sure if that was going to be the case. And, and, and experience actually improves it. It gives, obviously, direct support to on-the-job training and, obviously, indirect support to going to, for diversity training can, can help. Secondly, and I think most importantly, in the data in Syracuse, we find huge pairings of, of officers. And what typically happens is you and I are on the police force. We start in the police academy together. We become friends. Then... We join the police force, and the chief or captain says, hey, we need to pair up. Who wants to be partnered with whom? And of course, you're probably friends with a lot of people in your classmates, and that's how officers are too. So instead of matching experienced officer with inexperienced officer, they match together by, kind of by age or experience. And that is obviously the, the worst thing to do, right? If it looks like officers can learn on the job, then you'd want to match experienced officers with inexperienced officers, so hopefully they don't make these tremendous, tremendously bad decisions and, and help the inexperienced officers learn. Um, and most importantly, it does mean that actually we can, since racial profiling can go away, we can, we can fix this. It actually means that we can potentially live in a day where 
we, with enough training and uh, maybe some education growing up that we can um, really overcome and, and remove racial bias. So I'm super excited for the future. Obviously, we have a lot of challenges today. Thank you.